there was uh, a father that uh, overheard his uh, kids uh, playing in the backyard, except they were kind of fighting and kind of yelling a bit at each other and going back and forth. So it, it kind of, you know, the, the volume continued to, uh, to rise. And so he finally figured he needed to intervene. And he, he yelled out to see what's going on. And his daughter just stopped and said, that, that's okay, Daddy. We're just playing church. <laughs> There's fighting and quarreling that goes on among believers. That's, uh, that's the point here. The title of the message is, is, the, believe, uh, is the Battle Within. And it's all because of uh, basically a selfish nature that we have. Uh, and it's gotten, not gotten better, it's gotten worse because we, uh, I don't know if there's ever been a time where people live for pleasure more than, than, uh, than anything else. Uh, we put pleasure way ahead of people uh, these days. It's one of the the, the problems that we have uh, in our own culture. I uh, got sent this article. I thought it was an interesting. As of October 13, uh, on various forms of social media, people had posted 41 million pictures. We call them selfies. <laughs> 41 million. Uh, since uh, 2013, <clears throat> that's gone up 200%. <laughs> we, uh, yeah, listen, I've posted a few of my own, but uh, it's, just, it's just interesting where we've gone to as a, as a culture. But the spinoff of this is, is what's interesting. Uh, plastic surgeons in the United States, because of that, they say, have seen a huge demand for, for procedures, and they list all the, all the various ones. And when they did a, a survey to, to ask why people were, were coming in for plastic surgery at that particular time, one in three said it had to do with uh, their own image on social media. In other words, so they could have a better selfie. <laughs> uh, very, very interesting. Again, it's, it's our very n nature to be very concerned uh, about ourselves. Uh, when James kind of introduces this subject uh, there in chapter three, uh, this problem that we have, uh, he warns, warns and says not everybody should be teachers uh, because of the danger of the tongue and then spends a lot of time, we spend a couple of messages talking about that, uh, the danger of the tongue uh, with it we can bless God and curse man uh, at, uh, in the same breath. Uh, again, last week we looked at wisdom. We saw the wisdom of the world was very self-centered. The wisdom of God is behavior oriented. It's about learning to do uh, the right thing. Uh, and once again, James is gonna look at two opposing views. So let's look at the, the cause of the battle. Uh, it's self-centered, but uh, we'll look at a, uh, three or four aspects of it. Verses one to three, again, we're in chapter four. Where do wars and fights come from among you? Do they not come from your desires for pleasures that war in your members? You lust and do not have, you murder and covet and cannot obtain. You fight in war, yet you do not have because you uh, do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask amiss that you may spend it on your pleasure. So the cause of the self-centered life certainly involves a battle within what he asks is a very typical rabbinical style. Ask a question. What causes uh, quarrels or wars and fights among you. The, the you there is plural, so he's talking to uh, everyone. And the essence uh, of sin itself is selfishness. That's how it began. Uh, Eve disobeyed God because she, she wanted to eat the tree and become wise like God. Uh, Abraham lied about his wife because he was concerned about his own personal safety. Achan lied and took things he shouldn't have taken uh, at Jericho and caused the, the defeat of the Israeli army and, uh, and, and I. Uh, and specifically, that desire here is the battle within. It's the word hedon in the Greek where we get our word hedonistic or the desire for pleasure or pleasure is the chief get good. That's, that's really the problem and that's the idea of the culture that we find ourselves in that certainly can bleed right over into uh, the body of Christ. There's nothing wrong with wanting to have pleasure. There is something wrong if it's the driving passion of your life. In other words, the I live for the weekend, you know, uh, uh, person. Uh, this word is used several other times in the New Testament. It's, word, it's used of Jesus uh, in Luke chapter 8 in a familiar passage, Luke 8, 11. Jesus writing says, now the parable is this, the seed is the word of God. Uh, those by the wayside are the ones who hear, then the devil comes and takes away the word out of their hearts, lest they should believe and be saved. 
But the ones on the rock are those who, when they hear, receive the word with joy, and these have no root, who believe for a while in a time of temptation fall away. Now the ones that fell among the thorns are those who, uh, when they have heard, go out and are choked with cares, riches, and that's our same word, pleasures uh, of life and bring no fruit to maturity. But the ones that fell on the good soil are those who, having heard the word with a noble and a good heart, keep it and bear fruit with patience. The pleasures is a problem for at least one type of person in the parable. That person's life will produce no fruit or will never mature. Paul uses it when writing to Titus in Titus 3, 4, the same word. For we ourselves were also once foolish disobedient, deceived, serving various lusts uh, and pleasures. Uh, Paul says it's, uh, it's something we end up serving uh, at, a, at a point in time. Uh, and James is very explicit in how this searching for pleasure uh, brings misery in a person's life. Uh, the second cause of the self-centered life is rooted uh, not just in that word pleasure, that's really it, our desire for it, but in our two natures themselves. In verse 2 he says, you fight in war, Yet you do not have. And the, war, the word war here is the word for strategy. In other words, we all have a strategy, and it's, a, it's based on our desire for pleasure. Again, Paul is not addressing non-Christians. He's talking to the church. And he says, we have a very nature that is in us. There's a battle within us. Uh, it drives us to want to live for pleasure. We have a whole culture that's uh, uh, certainly caught up into that. Uh, In our very nature, we set up a strategy within our own selves for our own good and our own pleasure. And that's our tendency to do that. Uh, And and sometimes it's just even hard to hear it. But if you're honest with yourself and think about your own life, you'll recognize that there's a battle within. I've always said there's there's two kind of Christians in regards to this issue. They're the ones that recognize that there's a battle within. uh, And then they're the other group, which are liars. You know, so you're, you fall into one of those two categories of whether they, you recognize there's really a battle within. Uh, and Paul puts it this way. He says it's actually a law that's actually kind of driving us uh, in his uh, uh, long expose on this problem in Romans 6 and 7. In chapter 7, verse 21, he says, I find then a law that evil is present with me, the one who wills to do good. For I delight in the law of God according to the inward man, but I see another law in my members, parts of his body. Warring, there's our term again, against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. So Paul says there's actually a law that's driving us in this direction. Uh, James says we actually strategize in how to derive pleasure uh, for ourselves in terms of the battle within and the old nature. Uh, Paul puts it this way again in Galatians. Sometimes we call it a mini, uh, a mini version of Romans, so he addresses many of the same issues. In Galatians 5.17, he writes, For the flesh lusts against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to one another, so that you do not do the things that you wish but if you're led by the Spirit, you're not under the law. Again, that flesh sometimes is translated uh, uh, the old man. Uh, again, it's the nature, uh, the old nature that is within each of us. There's a battle that uh, is there. Uh, and that old nature is, is self-seeking. It has a focus on personal pleasure. Uh, and uh, it can dominate our thinking. Uh, and, uh, and James says it is at the root of relational problems. What, why, why do you fight and battle in relationships as believers? Well, it's rooted in our sin nature that has this drive for pleasure. Uh, and he says we need to, uh, to recognize it. It causes a lot of destruction. Uh, when I was in high school, two novels came out that, that were uh, uh, predicting the, the future in terms of what society would be like, problems in the future, uh, and so forth. Uh, and uh, one of them was written by George Orwell, 1984. And 1984 was uh, written by Orwell post uh, World War II. Uh, and he knew what big oppressive governments could do. He saw it in, uh, uh, in its uh, full realization within Nazi Germany uh, in Hitler's uh, attempt to take over the world. Uh, so he writes uh, 1984. 
Uh, and, uh, and that's where we get our phrase, uh, Big Brother is, uh, is watching you. And, uh, and uh, he, uh, he wanted to be clear uh, about what he felt like that big oppressive uh, government would look like and be like and be called. So he wrote a follow-up to a 1984 called Animal Farm. And in Animal Farm, he spells it out that the concern is communism. Uh, that, that is the concern for the future. Of course, this is again written which, uh, when I was in high school, uh, shortly after the earth was still cooling. It was, it was quite, a, quite a while ago, but not that long ago. Uh, and that was his big concern. Big oppressive government would be the detriment of people in the future. And he spells it out and says the problem would be communism itself as it attempts to spread uh, around the world. And now right at the same time, Another author named uh, uh, Adolf, Adolf, excuse me, I have to look, uh, Adolf Huxley, why can't I say his name all of a sudden? Brave writes Brave New World, uh, and that was very futuristic as well. His concern was that in the future, uh, technology and technological advances would become so that people had a lot more free time. Uh, and they had so much more free time that they became pleasure oriented and eventually pleasure dominated. And that would be the ruin uh, of culture itself. Now, uh, again, both written, uh, you know, late, mid to late 60s, uh, both predicting the future, you know, 20, 30 years in advance. Uh, one of them has come true and the other one hasn't. Uh, right now, in terms of communism, uh, it only exists within, uh, in, a, in a really uh, a morphed version of its uh, original intent within China. Uh, it exists in Cuba, and it exists on university campuses in the United States. <laughs> Does. Those are the only places where communism is still alive. It's pretty much dead. On the other hand, uh, what Huxley had to say is true. Uh, we, did <laughs> we do have those wonderful uh, technological advantages uh, that is supposed to give us more time, uh, and all they've led to is a desire for more and more uh, pleasure. That's really been the downfall uh, of our culture. Uh, and again, what we mean by pleasure is different things to different people. For some people, it's riding on a, a really good roller coaster. <laughs> Other people, it's an athletic event. Other people, it's their job, it's their career, it's their education. It's the whole concept of success. Uh, but it's all about self-recognition and a self-centered drive. And the problem is that the drive for pleasure can become very addictive because built into it is a, a principle called the law of diminishing returns uh, because it's never enough and it never satisfies. Uh, and that's, uh, that's the problem. Uh, John McMurray uh, uh, several generations ago said, the best cure for hedonism is an attempt to practice it. Uh, because it's, uh, it is not fulfilling, uh, and certainly we can uh, re read, uh, read in the periodicals and on the news constantly people that are, seem to have achieved great success but are very dissatisfied uh, with, with their lives. Uh, what it's done in terms of, of the church and, and ministries within our own culture is it resulted in a feel-good church for what we might call Christian life, uh, and yet people have huge... Uh, uh, problems in terms of, of relationships because the core issue has never been dealt with. Uh, it doesn't get better. He says in verse 2, you murder and covet and cannot obtain. You fight and you war. Again, this is being addressed to Christians. Well, did this, did this really happen within the, the early church? Well, it happened to, to David, uh, King David. First, he wanted something he could not have. Bathsheba. Second, he was willing to kill in order to have it. Third, it caused a terrible war of relationships within his family that existed to the day that, that he died. Now, I think the murder here is probably uh, in context of our previous uh, uh, chapter, uh, and the murder is probably character assassination by words, uh, but still uh, murder is used here. Uh, the pleasure you seek uh, will never bring pleasure is, is the idea. Uh, and, but there's a, a frantic pleasure first lifestyle that uh, is purported to us all the time in, in the media. Uh, I, I thought this was interesting. Uh, an experiment was done with, uh, with butterflies. Uh, and they would take two butterflies, uh, you know, beautiful monarch butterflies, put a male uh, and a female uh, in the same, same environment. 
uh, in, in which the male should be attracted to the female butterfly. Uh, they would then insert a cardboard cutout colored to look like a monarch butterfly, but really big. And the, the stupid male butterfly will go and light on the cardboard cutout every time uh, and, uh, and, uh, and have nothing to do with the actual real thing. Uh, people are seeking for pleasure all the time. Uh, God is the inventor of it. There's nothing wrong with it. Uh, but when it becomes the center of your life and an idol to you, uh, it never does lead to pleasure. Dr. Samuel Johnson uh, wisely said, of, of all that have tried the selfish experiment, let one come forth and say he has succeeded. He that has made gold his idol, has it satisfied him? He that has toiled in the fields of ambition, has he been repaid? He that has ransacked every theater of a sensual enjoyment, is he content? Can any answer in the affirmative, uh, not one? Uh, again, uh, pleasure never leads to what you think it's going to. We have the desires. All these desires can be met in a relationship with Jesus Christ. Uh, sometimes, again, that drive to meet our selfish needs can be seen in the context of, of marriage. Sometimes in doing premarital counseling or a couple's about to get married and they'll, I'll talk to them a little bit and I'll ask them, why are you getting married? It's interesting some of the questions, uh, and so, or excuse me, some of the responses I get. And I'm always concerned uh, if somebody says anything about a desire being met and having a, uh, well, I just know that if I'm married, you know, I, I, you know, I just feel so much better about myself. You know, I'll, you know, it, this is just what I've always wanted. This is what I've, all, you know, those aren't good answers. The good answer, in case I ask you someday, <laughs> the good answer is to say, uh, all of my needs have been met in a relationship in Jesus Christ. Therefore, I feel I'm now qualified to give to someone else. That, that's why you should be getting married. Not because you have some need you're hoping that other person will fulfill. Because it, it won't happen, by the way. Uh, all of these attempts to fulfill uh, my self-centered desires uh, will never bring satisfaction. And they cause fights, and quarrels among us. Thirdly, the cause of the self-centered life can affect our prayer life. We see that again in the second half of verse 2. Yet you do not have because you don't ask. So this is the person that he doesn't pray anymore. He's, he's stopped. Uh, this is the Christian that is so caught up in the self-centered existence that he's not even uh, praying anymore. Well, why should he? Because all he wants is a brand new Maserati. And after praying for that baby for, for a couple of weeks, he kind of realizes that's kind of a stupid prayer. I really don't think God's going to answer that prayer. So he just doesn't pray. And he doesn't pray about a lot of other things. Because, well, his drive in life is to have things and have pleasure. And he does kind of figure it out that God's probably not going to be answering those prayers. He doesn't pray. The second issue is, uh, is different. Uh, it's motivation. Uh, that's in verse 3. You ask and you do not receive because you ask amiss or the wrong motivation that you may spend it on your pleasures. That's our, our word again. Uh, the wrong motive. It's self-centered, pleasure-oriented. Uh, and you'll find that God is not very interested. Uh, it's possible to ask for something that's very good, but ask for it in the wrong motivation. I could be praying for my health and for God's protection over my life. It's a good thing so that I can go out and do something sinful. Well, that's, that's, that's not going to work. That's not going to work. Uh, it's it's the, uh, the gal who's married uh, and her husband's not saved. She's praying for him to come to the Lord, and she's praying for his salvation. That's, that's a good thing, right? That's a good thing. And the reason she's doing this is because she's tired of going to church alone. I'm, I'm serious. I mean, I've actually heard this. And she's tired of, you know, him not being there with her. Uh, God's not going to hear that prayer. She should be praying that he gets saved because if he doesn't, he will spend all eternity in hell apart from God and the love of Christ. That's the right motivation. So prayer has to do with motivation. And the motivation of our life, if it's driven by this sin nature that I have, 
that sets up a strategy within me to, to seek pleasure, if I'm not seeing that, if I'm not dealing with it, certainly it existed and dominated our lives as non-Christians. But we're talking about James is addressing believers. Paul says there's a battle with, within us in terms of that sin nature uh, and the new nature that God has given us. And, uh, uh, and the point that James is trying to make, I think, is that we have a tendency to lie to ourselves a lot of times. Uh, we find ourselves in fights and quarrels, and, uh, and uh, it's always that other person's fault uh, and never our own. Again, is James saying that Christians are never to enjoy uh, uh, you know, or desire pleasure? No. Again, God's the one that thought the whole thing up. He has wonderful things uh, for us. Uh, and uh, interesting, C.S. Lewis and his... Um, uh, wonderful uh, analogy uh, of the Christian life uh, screw tape letters uh, in, uh, in it. Uh, again, there's discussions between uh, demons and their attempts to draw Christians uh, uh, into sin and away from a relationship with God. Uh, and in the context of one of those conversations, uh, the following is said. Uh, never forget that when we're dealing with any pleasure, uh, it is, uh, it, uh, it's healthy and normal in its satisfying form. We are, in a sense, on the enemy's ground. In other words, this is what God does. God develops healthy, normal, satisfying pleasure uh, for us. Uh, I know we have won many a soul through pleasure. All the same, it's his invention, not ours. He made the pleasures. All our research so far has not enabled us to produce one. All we can do is to encourage the humans to take pleasures which our enemy has produced at times or in ways or in degrees which he has forbidden. Hence, we always try to work away from the natural condition of any pleasure to that in which it is least natural. An ever-increasing craving for an ever-diminishing pleasure is the formula. An ever-increasing craving for an ever-diminishing Pleasure is the formula. Let's get them to take something that God has made for pleasure and for satisfaction, and we'll just put it on steroids, uh, and we'll give them a greater craving for it. We'll take it out of its natural. Let's just, let's just take the, the world of uh, sensuality, sexuality. God intends it for measure, for pleasure in the context of marriage. Let's take it out of that natural condition and put it in an unnatural condition that he never met. Uh, it will never be satisfying. Uh, it will never do what people think that it will do. It drives, drives a lot of the marketing in our world. It drives a lot of the culture. Uh, all true pleasure, again, authored by God. Psalm 37, 4 says, Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Psalm 16, 11, You have made known to me the path of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence with eternal pleasures at your right hand. Again, pleasures like anything else can become a, an idol. And uh, uh, in the end, that idol will lead to uh, idolatry. Uh, and, uh, and, and we see it all, all around us. I, not that long ago, I was uh, <coughs> driving uh, downtown. I happened to be going by the Blaisdell. And, uh, and I saw all, all of these people lined up out front, like in, uh, in beach chairs and sitting on the concrete or whatever. And I, I proceeded a little further down the block. There's some, you know, where they have the marquee down there. There's some, you know, big, big time band coming. So there were, there were all the people <laughs> lined up willing to sit there all day and all night and maybe all day and all night, you know, to get, to get that tick, ticket to get in. But that's not bondage. <laughs> no, that's what idolatry does. Uh, it's, uh, now, if it was a Super Bowl, it'd be different. I just I had to have a qualifying statement. There. But you see what I mean? You get the point? Uh, it's, it's like we, we can just be driven by things for pleasure's sake and not even think about it. Uh, Ken Hughes says uh, the following, and I'm going to pull the slide out, out of context here a little bit. Uh, our second point is going to be the cure for the battle within, and I'm going to read that in a moment. But uh, Ken Hughes says, uh, in today's world, truly fee, fee, uh, free people are exceptions. Uh, most are like marionette, marionettes suspended and animated by a thousand strings of purported pleasure. Some bounce puppet-like on the terrible strings of alcohol and drugs. Others' animus comes from pleasure-giving technology, cars, hot tubs, waterbeds, and stereos. Still others lay lifeless until they are brought to life by sports and entertainment. Millions of people rise and shower, drive their cars, walk the streets, ride elevators, return home and go out in apparent freedom 
while actually never making a move, uh, not due to the tug of a self-centered pleasure. Even Christians are not immune to such bondage. Uh, there's, uh, we, we allow ourselves into a bondage and the strings are being pulled by the culture and what's supposed to be uh, and what is supposed to bring pleasure to us. Uh, the problem is within. Uh, again, it's a self-centeredness. It's the rooted in the two natures that we have. It can even affect our prayer lives. Uh, the cure uh, for the battle is given in verses 4 to 6. Adulterers and adulteresses. Again, speaking to the church. <laughs> Do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whoever, therefore, wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Or do you think that the scriptures says in vain, the spirit who dwells in us yearns jealously, but he gives more grace. Therefore, he says, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. So what's the cure? The cure involves uh, turning away from a love of the things of this world. Now, again, he uh, starts out pretty heavy. Adulterers and adulteresses, again, Jewish context, that uh, means you've, uh, you've given your heart to an idol. Uh, it's a kind of a prophetic language here. Ezekiel, Jeremiah, Hosea, you know, others use this. They, and when they're, they're calling the people away from idols and back to, to God, they would for, refer to them as having committed spiritual adultery. That's the, uh, the language of Rabbi James uh, talking to his Jewish audience here. Uh, friendship with the, the world, what does it mean? Uh, well, again, uh, it's, I think there's two aspects to it. The, world, uh, the word in the Greek is cosmos. Uh, it's talking about the world system or an evil world system. Uh, Paul mentions it in a couple of places, as does uh, John in his first epistle. Uh, there's, a, there's a world system that's out there. Uh, John, even in his day, says that the spirit of the Antichrist is already out there. Not the person, but the spirit of to lead people uh, away, from, away from the Lord. And if you're not sure about that, just watch, watch the news tonight. And they'll confirm exactly uh, what, uh, what I'm saying. Uh, secondly, uh, the world has, uh, uh, the world certainly has the connotation of the problem within, according to John. In 1 John 2, 2.15, uh, John writing there says, do not love the world, same issue, same subject, do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, uh, the love of the Father is not in him. Uh, so what, what does that mean? What does that consist of? Verse 16, for all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world, and the world is passing away, and the lust of it, but he who does the will of God abides uh, forever. Uh, and so, again, uh, that inward, there is the, uh, a world system that is against Christ, that is out there, that is evil, uh, and so forth. Uh, there is the internal battle and struggle that is within the world described by John as the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, uh, and, and the pride of life. And I think that there's a, a, a threefold uh, downward spiral uh, to uh, arriving at this destination that James is concerned about. And the first one, uh, first aspect is influence. Uh, even as believers, we're, well, we live in the world. We're influenced by it. Uh, if you watch TV, if you listen to the radio, if you uh, uh, read the news or whatever, you're, you're influenced by it. Everything has their, uh, everything has their bias uh, in their attempt to make their, uh, their point uh, and, uh, and so forth. And uh, I'll just give you an example of this and, and say that you ought to be praying for Israel. As you know, Israel has been, uh, have a series uh, of terrorist attacks over the last two weeks. Uh, they've, they've built walls uh, to protect themselves uh, from suicide bombers uh, that took place during the second infantada. Uh, but now uh, they're calling for young men, typically 15 to 20 or so, young Palestinians to just take a knife and just randomly stab people. Very, very hard to stop. Uh, in one case recorded on video, a man runs, uh, there's people waiting at a bus stop and he rams his car into the people it's knocking them on the ground, then jumps out with a meat cleaver and begins uh, hacking, hacking them up. Now, in all of these cases, uh, what happens is either, uh, again, everybody in Israel uh, pretty much serves in the military, uh, and so they all know how, to, they know how to carry a weapon and how to use it. Uh, and the uh, mayor of Jerusalem has asked them to 
carry your weapons, uh, carry them openly so, pe so people can see. Uh, and in the one video I mentioned, you'll see a, a passer buyer pull out his gun, run over there, uh, and while the guy with the meat cleaver in his hand with blood dripping down his arm shoots him uh, and kills him to, to save the lives of the people that were still there on the ground. In response to that, the news is reporting about the terrorism that's going on among the Palestinians and among the Jewish population. In other words, what that guy did was a terrorist act because he shot a gun and killed somebody even though he was actually saving the lives of, of others. That's, that's the way the uh, media is reporting it. Keep in mind that CNN, CNN International is owned about 90% by Saudi Arabians. Uh, they're just a little biased <laughs> towards uh, Israel. Uh, and they, they dominate uh, the international news scenes uh, and, uh, and so forth. And that are, uh, all to say is that uh, you'll hear a news story and they have an agenda behind it. Uh, you'll see a movie uh, and there's an agenda behind it. And uh, unless it's a Christian film, there's an agenda behind it too, but uh, it's usually a good one. Uh, we're influenced uh, by, the, uh, by our society in tremendous ways, and we need to be careful. Uh, that influence then leads to indifference. Uh, indifference is uh, we become indifferent to the things that typically would be hostile to God. Uh, soon pleasures, videos, music, movies, entertainment uh, that at one time would maybe offend us now is simply we're influenced by it, so now we're, we're indifferent to it. It might be demeaning to God, but well, it doesn't really bother us uh, like it used to. Uh, it, it could be, well, it is a little vulgar. Uh, yeah, it's kind of, I realize there's, there's some parts of this that are kind of sexually explicit, you know, but for the most part, you know, I, you know, I don't really have a problem with, see, I, I, I become indifferent uh, because I've allowed things to influence me and that leads to the third step of this downward spiral, which is acceptance. Uh, when, at one time, something would have been offensive, and now it becomes uh, accepted to me. Uh, somebody has referred to, one writer I like this, referred to James as the in-your-face apostle. <laughs> because he's just, and I just applaud you guys for coming back every week. I just want to say that right <laughs> up the top. But uh, uh, just keep in mind that I, I you get this for 45 minutes. I've, I've had to be in this for hours all, all week long. So I'm, I'm really bearing the brunt of this on, on behalf of all of us. But uh, uh, we need to think through. Uh, 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 you know, have I become indifferent? Uh, are things influencing me? And I'm beginning to ex accept what is an evil world that's out there. I have an inward problem in my own heart that strategizes for my own pleasure. There's a battle within, and the cure for it is, I can't be a friend of this world uh, and be a friend of God uh, at, at the same time. I cannot love this world. Of course, we love the people of the world, but the world system and the struggle within that lends itself to my downward spiral. Secondly, the cure involves the problem of envy. That's in verse 5. Or do you think that the scripture says in vain, the spirit who dwells in us yearns jealously? Uh, verse 5 is one of the more difficult passages uh, in, in the New Testament uh, for two reasons. And try, in terms of saying, what does this really say? Uh, and one problem is that uh, James makes reference uh, to Scripture saying something. He says, uh, or do you think the Scripture says in vain? And then there's a quote. Uh, the spirit who dwells in us yearns jealousy. The problem is you can't find that in Scripture. Uh, so, again, most commentators believe, well, he's talking about a big theme that's in the Bible. Uh, this is a big issue that's in the Bible that's uh, uh, addressed in, uh, in, in many places as opposed to an exact quote. And I think that's a good, uh, a good explanation for the first problem. The second problem has to do with the word spirit there. The spirit who dwells in us yearns jealousy. Now, if you have a New King James, like I've just read from, then you'll note that the word spirit is capitalized, indicating it's the Holy Spirit. Uh, now, there's, uh, there's other very good translations uh, that spirit is not capitalized uh, because it's uh, believed to be our spirits and not the Holy Spirit. The NIV, for example, says, uh, or do you think scripture says without reason that the spirit he caused to live in us envies intensely? Uh, it's our spirit that he's talking about 
so the translators of the NIV. And you know, I've read a lot of commentaries and, it, and very good people go back and, and forth on this. Uh, I just want to give you my take on it that I think, I hope will be helpful. A couple of things to, uh, to consider. And I really think it's, it's the struggle within. I think it's our spirit and not God's Holy Spirit. Uh, here's a couple of reasons why. Uh, that passage begins with or, or, consider this. In other words, it ties directly with what we've already been talking about. We haven't been talking about God's spirit in us and what's going on. We're talking about our spirit in us and the battle that's within and within our own nature. Uh, the word jealousy here, sometimes, sometimes translated envy, has a very evil connotation. Uh, it's a very intense word, and it is never used for God. God is jealous because he loves us. That's not the word that's used here. This has an evil connotation. It's never used of God. Uh, therefore, I think it has to be referring to us. Uh, it's uh, our spirit that's being uh, made reference to. Uh, therefore, we ask ourselves, has the Spirit of God caused us to live in intense envy? Uh, no, I think the problem is my own heart. Jeremiah 17, 9 says, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Uh, who, who can know it? And, uh, and we could go on and on with passages that, uh, like that that you probably have uh, written down in a magnet on your refrigerator. I just need to remind myself how wicked I am each and every day. No, we don't have a tendency to put those up on the refrigerator. Uh, but it's true. Uh, it's, it's part of the cure. It's part of the cure. If we don't realize what the problem is, we're never going get, to get to the cure. Uh, we need to be careful that uh, we're not more in love with this world than we are Jesus Christ, and we're falling into, in a sense, into its its, uh, its values uh, over, over us and our thinking. Uh, we need to remember that the problem really is, I have a problem within my own heart that uh, leads to uh, intense jealousy. Uh, and that, that's not a good thing. Uh, the cure for the self-centered life is recognizing those two things uh, and therefore uh, we can turn to God uh, and his grace. Uh, we need to understand our own depravity our tendencies and so forth, so that we will, as he says, give more grace. We want more grace. Satan is the author of the DIY religion. He wants you to do it yourself. Uh, but uh, God is the author of, of, uh, of grace. Uh, notice that in the midst of this description of our depravity, James says he gives more grace. Again, he's not talking about saving grace. He's talking about sustaining grace to help us through uh, each and every day. The writer of Hebrews says this in Hebrews 4.16, Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. It's not talking about salvation. It's just talking about getting through uh, the rigors of life and the world that we live in. Uh, the battle that I have within my own heart, the cure is to cry out to God and ask for his grace. And Paul affirms in Romans 5.20 that where sin aboundeth, grace aboundeth much more. Which leads to uh, and led and inspired a, a beautiful poem by Annie Johnson Flint a number of years ago. Where she writes, he giveth more grace when the burdens grow greater. He sendeth more grace when the labors increase. To added afflictions, he addeth his mercy. To multiplied trials, he multiplies peace. When we have exhausted our store of endurance, when our strength has failed ere the day is half done, when we reach the end of our hoarded resources, our Father's full giving is only begun. His love has no limits, his grace has no measure, his power has no boundary known unto men. For out of his infinite riches in Jesus, he giveth and giveth and giveth again. We simply ask, but we'll never ask if we kind of lie to ourselves about the problem. Uh, we have to understand the cause before we'll ever take the cure. The, the last aspect of this, very important, uh, the cure only comes to the humble. Verse 6, but he gives more grace. Therefore, he says, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Uh, you can either have God opposing you or you can have him uh, giving your grace. The qualification uh, is, uh, is humility. Uh, we need to wake up every day understanding our own depravity, our self-centeredness, so that we'll ask for grace uh, that day. 
uh, asking for grace uh, in, in humility. Sometimes we, uh, we use the phrase of dying to ourselves so that we might live for Christ. Paul said, for me to live uh, you know, in Christ is, is what I'm shooting for. Uh, and the problem is my sin nature prevents me from, from doing that. I uh, uh, heard a number of years ago a uh, uh, story the missionaries, the first missionaries to go to Fiji, uh, their, uh, their last name was the Bakers. Uh, and, uh, and as they went, if you think about going to, being a missionary to Fiji today, you might think, oh, that wouldn't be so bad. <laughs> but in that day, they were known for one particular thing, and that was headhunting. So uh, people didn't survive long when they hit the beach. Uh, so no missionaries had ever gone to Fiji. So this family, mother and father and kids, uh, they, they leave. God's called them to Fiji. Uh, they make their way there on several ships. And finally, in a very small boat of somebody that uh, lived in the area, knew the waters well, and knew the reputation of the Fijians. Uh, and so as, uh, uh, as uh, Pastor Baker got into the boat, a small boat, uh, with his family to go ashore, uh, that... Uh, ship's captain pleaded with him uh, one more time. And he said, uh, if you go to shore, you will surely be killed. And he returned and said, we died before we came. That's how you do stuff like that. If your life is really given over to the Lord. Uh, you know, how do we overcome this drive within us that has a strategy for pleasure that we seek out, uh, ingrained in our nature, permeated in the culture that we live in uh, today, uh, in, uh, in an evil, in a fallen world. It's by the grace of God, uh, but we need to recognize we have to come and receive it in humility. But I want to give you uh, the benefits, if we will. And uh, there are many, if you, if you looked up the word humility in the New Testament uh, and just read uh, about it and what it will do in your life, uh, you'd come up with a lot more than this, but it, here's four. God's grace can give us an emotional peace. It stops the war, the relational wars, uh, but it gives us an emotional peace. According to Jesus in Matthew eleven twenty-eight. 28, come to me, all you who are labor and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart. That's our same word, humility. And you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden uh, is light. Secondly, this grace will give us unity with other believers. Paul in Ephesians 4 1 says, I therefore the prisoner of the Lord beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called with all lowliness. That's our same word, humility. And gentleness with long suffering, bearing with one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. Humility will lead to emotional peace and it will lead to a unity with other believers. Thirdly, God's grace will give us the ability to forgive. Paul writes in Colossians 3.12, Therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering, bearing with one another and forgiving one another. The humility is the key to forgiveness. If you're, if you're struggling uh, to forgive someone, uh, humility is probably uh, at, at the root uh, cause that's preventing you from being able to, to do that. Uh, and fourthly, God's grace will give you success that is truly satisfying. In Luke 14, uh, 8, uh, Jesus says, uh, When you are invited by anyone to a wedding feast, do not sit down in the best place, lest one more honorable than you be invited by him. And he who invited you and, uh, and him come and say to you, uh, Give place to this man, uh, and then you begin with shame to take the lowest place. But when you are invited, go and sit in the lowest place, so that when he who invited you comes, he may say to you, friend, go up higher. Then you will have glory in the presence of those who sit at the table with you. For whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exhaust, exalted. Uh, there is a place for, for succeeding, for being exalted, but, it, but it's, it's rooted in humility. And that's the only way it'll ever be, ever be satisfying. 
Uh, and, and I can tell you with some of the some of the military guys as well as some business guys I've known that have been quote very successful and uh, in reaching their goals and so forth. Uh, by the time they get there, they could care less uh, because uh, really they're, by then their life is all about doing something for the Lord and what God's calling them to do and a, a Sunday school class that they teach or you know whatever whatever it might be. Yeah, they get exalted in the end, but they there's still a humility about them. They really it's nice. It's a platform for them, maybe, for the Lord to use them, uh, but it's not a, it's not a big deal. Uh, it, it, it doesn't ruin them. Uh, it doesn't uh, uh, come along and then uh, bring a, a complete dis- dissatisfaction. One of the, <coughs> I truly will quit after this, but uh, interesting, I, the, uh, I just found this interesting. One of the phenomena, as I'm getting a little older, one of the phenomena in our culture today, of course, is that people are living much, uh, much longer. So you have people retiring uh, and not retiring for three and four and five years uh, before they go to be with the Lord. That, that's the way it was, you know, a, 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 gen- a couple generations ago. You know, you just, you just didn't live that long. But now people are retiring, and they're retired for like 20, 30 years. Uh, that's a long time to think about what your life was spent on and how you used your life. Uh, there's a tremendous problem with seniors and depression. Because of people looking, but they have a lot of time to look back over their life and figure out that uh, I didn't make some real good choices. There's a lot of regretting uh, going on about uh, the goals and the success and the things that drove them that in the end absolutely brought no satisfaction at all. And I would just encourage you to not, not get in that position where you look back over your life with lots of regrets. There's this little battle going on inside you strategizing within you and your old nature to drive you to pleasure. That pleasure could be, again, a certain education, a relationship. It could be any a number of things. Uh, that pleasure and that drive becomes an idol. Uh, you become like it, uh, and it's, uh, uh, it causes tremendous problems in, uh, in relationships. What causes the battles within you, the wars within you? Uh, it's a self-centeredness that's in each one of us. And the cure for it is the grace of God that God will even more give upon us. We just come in, in true humility to receive it. Amen. All right. Let's go.